nonprofit organization that focuses on making uh, data in St. Louis more accessible and usable. Um, in addition to that, I co-chair the data working group for the St. Louis Vacancy Collaborative, which is we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about uh, later in the presentation. Um, so uh, what we're going to talk about is vacancy. So St. Louis has a problem. Um, about 15% of all parcels in the city of St. Louis are vacant. That uh, that's 8,000 vacant buildings, about 13,000 vacant lots, and it's not proportionate, like it's not evenly distributed. Um, you can pr see pretty clearly on the line what we refer to as the Del Mar Divide. Um, there's a street called Del Mar that runs uh, east to west. Um, that is the sharp, at least last time I checked, was the sharpest income divide on the face of the earth. Um, you literally have $10 million homes across the street from vacant lots filled with needles. Um, and uh, so 30% of the parcels north of that street are vacant and only 3% south are vacant. So like you can see, like it's a huge disparity. And this is a problem because as we we're very fond of saying, nothing good happens in a vacant building, right? Um, there, it's bad for um, the economy. It's bad, like they're unsafe. Um, we've got really heartbreaking stories of children that are afraid to go to their bus stop because of all the like scary vacant buildings next to it. Um, to just kind of help put uh, put this in perspective, uh, the, the thing that St. Louis is unfortunately known for in the last like five years is uh, like the, the big Ferguson event. And Ferguson, while outside of this map, is north of Del Mar, like just outside the boundary of what, what we're looking at here. Um, not actually the problem we're here to talk about today though. Um, what's more interesting to me is like we don't, you know, everybody kind of knew this was a problem, but we didn't know how to address it. Like, how do you address something if there's like so much you don't understand? Um, the city didn't know how many vacant properties there were, like could, didn't have a solid number. Um, we, and without that, you don't have a way to measure how effective the measures you're taking to combat it are working. Um, how do you prioritize stabilization efforts, demolition, things like that? Um, we didn't even have a solid definition of vacant, like what vacant meant. Um, it's actually a really hard problem when you start getting into it because like your gut reaction is like, oh, well, it's a building nobody lives in. But like there are a lot of buildings that nobody lives in that aren't actually a problem, right? Like somebody moves out and for a while there, nobody lives there and then somebody moves in. We're looking for chronic vacancy or blight, right? Things that are a burden to the city. Um, still not quite the problem that I wanted to address. So in... Uh, 2017, the mayor hosted a hackathon to ask for help with this problem. So the hackathon was to visualize vacancy in the area. Um, Michael, who's like one of my volunteers here, um, and I went as just kind of a fun thing to do on the weekend. I was like a uh, consultant at the time. Um, and we very quickly realized that nobody was going to be able to actually do this because the data that we were provided was a dumpster fire. Um, Columns weren't named, <laughs> right, like columns weren't, no, city, like the city like, owns up to this. Like the columns weren't named very well, um, nothing was normalized, we didn't have proper data definitions, we didn't know what stuff meant, it was spread out over like a whole host of uh, different data sets. And this problem, this problem interests me. Um, I'm a long time technology person, I'm a long time data person, this problem, vacancy was kind of like, yeah, like it's bad, but like I don't have any personal connection to that issue. I have a personal connection to bad data. <laughs> um, so how does this, this, like this is probably a tale you guys have heard, right? Like most cities, like most local governments don't have great data. Even if they have a good open data program, I would say St. Louis actually has a really good open data program. Most of what the city has is available on our open data portal. It's just really hard to use. Um, and the, the reason this happens, like first off, most of this is adopted from legacy systems, right? Um, City of St. Louis has been around for like 200 years. For a long time, paper, you know, all, all the reporting, using the assessor's office as an example, everything was done on like in books, right? And then Excel came out and someone got the bright idea of like, I'll make an Excel spreadsheet and that will make this easier, right? But eventually that Excel spreadsheet got too full. So they're like, okay, I hear databases are a thing. Microsoft provides this tool called Access. Let me like watch some YouTube videos and see if I can figure this out, right? And that's just kind of how it springs up. So they reflect 
antiquated processes and they're not designed as uh, with the technology in mind, right? Um, the individual departments are siloed. Like, so, you know, so the assessor's office does this with their data and then the building division does the exact same thing with their data, but they're not communicating with each other. So now you've got like two separate databases, right? And sometimes even within that, you've got the building division might have three or four different databases that serve different functions. Um, and depending on who made them, um, a great example of this, like for uh, identifying parcels, just like a unique ID for each parcel, we have three different ones. Um, depending on what data set you're looking at. Um, and worse, they look very similar. <laughs> so it's really hard to tell just from looking at a data set, which if it's not properly labeled, because most of the time it just says parcel ID, you don't even know which identifier they're using. Um, so on, tack on top of this, like, you know, because everybody's just kind of doing this to try to get their jobs done, um, there's no real change process. So like at, updates are pretty ad hoc. Um, eventually an IT department gets formed and they're, they're just trying to like manage this mess. Um, but their job, you know, they're not really in a place to actually improve things. Um, because it's really hard to get strategic support for this type of thing, right? No politician is going to run on a platform. It's going to get elected because they're willing to fix some arcane technical issue that while it has a huge impact, like the, you know, average voter doesn't understand it. All they understand is that it's expensive and like, well, things seem to be running okay right now. So like, why do we need to invest X million dollars into upgrading our systems? Be like, well, your current systems run on COBOL. Like it's, it's antiquated. Um, so that, that's kind of how this all gets uh, put into place. And I, like, I, I'm really impressed by like what our city IT is able to do with the limited resources they have. And they've been very helpful to me, what, like in our work, as we kind of uh, try to address this problem. Um, so in order to build kind of a vacancy portal, we took data from four different offices. So the assessor's office, the building division, the forestry department, and the uh, our land bank. So if you're not familiar with like how land banks work, basically if the city forecloses on a property, it goes into a holding uh, unit uh, in our case called the Land Reutilization Authority or the LRA, whose job it is is to like resell it and get it back in the market. Um, so we took data from all these different agencies, we combined it into one data set, and we built a website. Um, doo -doo -doo. There we go. Um, so this is what the website looks like today. Um, this data hasn't been updated since June of 2018. You can see we've got a little disclaimer of like, hey, we're working on it. But this is the city of St. Louis. Um, each block represents a vacant parcel. So it could be a vacant building or a vacant lot. Um, we've got um, a probability attached to it. So darker colors mean we know it's vacant, whereas a lighter color means it's like we're kind of on the fence. Um, and you can sort by address. You can look by is it privately owned or does the LRA own it? Um, you can look for individual owners. You can filter by neighborhood. And if you look at any given property in detail, It'll pull up more detailed information about that property. And this, this box is um, uh, adaptive based off of what you're looking at. So you'll get different type of information for a lot than a parcel because different data is available, right? You'll get different, uh, if the LRA owns it, you'll get pricing because the LRA has like rules for how they price their properties based off of, you know, it's cheaper for you to buy a lot that's right next to a house you already own than it is for you to buy a random lot somewhere, right? That kind of thing. Um, but we can, because those are algorithmically determined, we can kind of put all the prices here so you can see what that looks like. Um, and you know, some links to other site, other, other stuff, um, sites where you can get more information that doesn't need to be there. Okay. Um, so we released this thing and it's had a, like a tremendous effect. Um, it really sparked a lot of conversation about this problem in this, in St. Louis. Um, it's something that everybody kind of knew was going on. Like, you know, like I grew up being told, like, don't go to this part of town. Um, but now like we have numbers for it, right? We can actually discuss it. We can learn things like, uh, one real estate developer owns 14% of all the vacant properties in the city of St. Louis. Um, you know, that is a very different type of discussion than we have a lot and it's a problem. <laughs> um, and it led to the formation of the, uh, St. Louis Vacancy Collaborative, which is a kind of an informal alliance of nonprofits, private industry, and government agencies that are working to tackle this problem. 
Um, so you, we've been able to use this to help prioritize demolitions. Um, we, there's been, it sparked some informative dialogue around the problem. Um, it's allowed not us to work on this. Um, that's probably the biggest thing for me is I'm trying to clean this data up so that other people that know more about this problem can do meaningful work. Um, and we'll talk more about like my longer term solution for that in a minute. Um, but yeah, like government and academia are starting to use this data set to answer questions and to actually make change, which is fantastic. Um, so all this kind of happens and this, that this takes us up to about four months ago. Um, at that point, uh, the St. Louis Regional Data Alliance was formed, which is a similar kind of informal um, alliance of uh, organizations that are interested in this problem of data transparency. Um, so a job posting goes up for Data Architect, and I'm an IT consultant at the time, and be like, this description sounds an awful lot like the volunteer work I've been doing for the last two years. <laughs> so I apply, got the position, and now here I am. So uh, the Regional Data Alliance tackles a bunch of different stuff. Um, these are the kind of the four big things that I'm working on right now. Um, we have like a whole other guy who's only working in the healthcare space. I can't speak as much. He's building something called the Community Information Exchange that helps uh, these healthcare industries talk with each other and with um, external service agencies, right? So like a, a homeless shelter, like it's really helpful for a homeless shelter to know if you just got out of the hospital because you had a heart attack. Like that's good for them to know, but because of HIPAA laws, it's like very difficult <laughs> information to share. So he's tackling that problem and I can't really get, tell you how he's tackling that problem because I'm not working on that. But these are the things I'm working on. So the first is the regional data exchange. Uh, is anybody in here familiar with CCAN or has used CCAN before? Okay, so for those of you that haven't, CCAN is an open data platform. Uh, it's open source. Its main competitor is Socrata, which costs like $10,000 a year. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a platform so you can build a website that hosts open data and uh, makes it searchable and easy to use. Um, so we wanted a CCAN instance set up, but it's, if those of you who are familiar with it, it's kind of a huge pain in the butt to set up. <laughs> um, you have to know a lot of architecture. You got to know like a lot of different technologies because it uses a lot of different things. Um, so we've spent the last three months, um, not just getting ours stood up, but writing Terraform script. So if those of you that aren't familiar, Terraform is infrastructure as code. So basically we architected out a Docker-based installation of CCAN with a load balancer and a search engine and the uh, a, a database that's been separated out. And we open source the code that allows you to stand this up in AWS. So now our three months of work, you can replicate in like a couple hours um, in AWS. Um, just by running some code and making the appropriate tweaks to configure for your environment, you know, use your name and password, your domain name, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's the data exchange. Uh, the portal, oh, well, we'll come, get back to the portal. Uh, below that, uh, I just have a table because we don't have much to show for this yet. But uh, later this month, I'm kicking off a pilot program where consulting agencies are contributing their uh, benched consultants to our organization to work on a project. So, which is going to dramatically increase our uh, scalability and what we're capable of doing. Um, those of you that work in this kind of space, I would love to talk to you more about how we do this. Um, but essentially, we're going to be getting six full-time developers for free. Um, and they're going to be working on what we're calling the regional entity database. So, all of that work we did combining the data sets, right? We, we have those like 12 data sets from the four different agencies. Um, that was a one-time thing. Like we did it and it was done. And that's how like I feel a lot of us do our work, right? We're interested in answering a question, so we do the, do the we can join everything, um, we do our analysis, and then it's basically static. Um, what I'm, we're finding is that a lot of researchers, urban planners, et cetera, are doing that same, the same joins over and over and over and over and over again. It's like 80% of their jobs is what we're hearing is, well, I'm taking stuff from the labor department, I'm connecting it with census data, with OpenStreetMap data, I do all these joins, and then I do my analysis, and then I package that up, I spit it out, I start my next project, I take the labor department data, I combine it with the census data, right, over and over again. So we're doing it once. We're gonna take all the data that the city of St. Louis has regarding um, uh, parcels, and we are automating a process to create an uh, a constantly updating data set that anybody can access and use. 
So at any time you can get the freshest pull of what the data looks like. We should also have an API so you can just connect to it and you don't even have to download it. You can just query it. Um, so that's the project that they're going to be tackling. Um, and that's going to power the next version of our vacancy database. Um, so that that portal, instead of being outdated by over a year, <laughs> will update daily, weekly. We got to look at how quickly the data itself actually refreshes. Um, but it will be constantly be up to date and I won't have to be constantly badgered by people that are like, this is great. How do we like, you know, <laughs> uh, when are you going to update the data set? Be like, well, it's going to take me like 80 hours to update that data set. Like it's a lot of work. <laughs> so let's, I'm, we're going to do it right this time. Um, and then finally, this is something that we just announced the other day. Um, we were accepted into a, an accelerator program hosted by Datakind, which is a nonprofit that does code for good, essentially, uh, and Microsoft uh, to build an AI assessor. So one of the questions related to vacancy that we've been seeing a lot of is, what is the loss? How much are these vacancy, vacant properties depressing property values? And that's a very difficult question to answer. So what we're going to do is we're going to train an AI to act as an assessor. We're going to feed it everything we know about every building in the city of St. Louis, including its proximity to vacant properties. We're going to train it to, using that data, get the assessed value. And then once we have that, we can give it the same data set, but we can tell it that there are no vacancies. And it will appraise the entire city of St. Louis as if it had no vacancies in it. And that should get us that depressed property value. Um, it's really exciting. Uh, we're, we're super pumped to be doing it. Um, and all of this, everything that we're working on is in GitHub. So any, if any of these projects sound like, hey, my city could really use this, please like connect up with me and let's uh, be happy to share what we have. Uh, yeah. So questions. <laughs> oh, thank you. Oh, uh, yeah. We do, yes, and actually a lot of this work came from us going to the uh, NNIP conference like three months ago, whenever that was. Um, I basically got hired and immediately went to NNIP, which was fun. <laughs> so what? Oh, it's the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership. Um, it's basically organizations all over the country that use that are trying to use data to do economic and community development. Um, and the, the way they work is e each city that's a member, there's like an organization that represents them. There might be other people that come to the conferences and stuff with them, but like they have a dedicated entity in St. Louis. Um, and luckily our, uh, uh, one of our board, the board members of the, uh, regional data Alliance is also a board member for NNIP. So we have a good in there. So, uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, I'm I'm actually pulling up my notes on how this all works. Um do 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 government. IT. There we go. Uh, let's see if I can zoom in on here. So, pardon the like crude drawing. <laughs> uh, these are my like meeting notes as we discuss this, and we are in the process of revamping this whole system. So this could all change in like six months. But in the top left, you see our three primary handles. We have what we call parcel nine, parcel eleven, and handle. And handle's what theoretically everybody should be using. Um, and they're all, uh, as you can see, they're all very similar, right? They all have block number, sub block, and parcel, but parcel 11 also has this condo code in the middle that is almost always zero. Um, and this owner code at the end, which is also almost zero. Um, and they will have some, so, some number of arbitrary zeros attached to the front, <laughs> um, which makes it even worse, right? Because then you can't even tell how many digits it's supposed to be. Um, and then finally, handle is basically parcel 11, but you take that owner code off, which is almost always zero. You string kind of an arbitrary number of zeros, and then you throw a one at the front so that those zeros actually stay there. 
<laughs> so, um, right? And so you, what we end up doing is, you know, um, I'm going through data sets and I'm trying to, you know, we want to join different things. I got to figure out which one of these they're using and how to convert them all into one thing. And the easiest thing usually is to just build handle from data that's in the data set if it has everything I need to, to assemble it. And then I can just say like, well, there's handle. Um, otherwise, what we're doing is we're, <laughs> if it's, if we can tell that it's parcel 11, we just cut that zero off, add a one to the front, and that works sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Um, we're working to a more uh, um, GIS-based system, um, which is going to help quite a bit. Um, uh, and we're also like revamping the system where it'll be a, I forget what we settled on. We're still having the meeting, so it's, it's constantly in flex anyway. Um, there was another problem with this that I was going to share that I can't, I just suddenly spaced on. We are also having that discussion right now. Um, so, no, it, so it sounds like what is currently happening is the, um, and we're t this is tied in with another problem of like addresses. There is no like central list of addresses in the city of St. Louis, right? And nobody's responsible for that. There is no like canonical source of like valid addresses. Um, so we're, we're kind of addressing that now, but it sounds like right now the, and an address and an identifier gets assigned when a building permit gets put, uh, uh, gets filed, but it doesn't become official until the assessor's office actually like finalizes all of that. Um, oh, I did remember what the other piece was, and this uh, probably pertains to a lot of this. If you want to connect this type of data to OpenStreetMap data, one of the things, you know, A, OpenStreetMap doesn't deal with parcels, obviously. Like that's a pr problem A. Um, uh, but Problem B is like all of this data is at the parcel level, but a lot of it's building specific. And so you get, as soon as you have multiple buildings on one parcel, suddenly I've got duplicate records that I can't tell if they're referring to the same building or two different buildings. Um, you know, condos cause a lot of issues with this sort of uh, data work um, and buildings that span multiple parcels. So if you have a, like a stadium in your town, it's probably on more than one parcel of land. Um, and that also, if you're doing all of your work at the parcel level, causes a lot of confusion, a lot of weirdness. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, um, my, our goal here is um, in this talk is mostly to to kind of familiarize yourself, you guys, with like other data sets that might be joining with OpenStreetMap and some of the challenges that lie there, and some of the strategies, and some of the community organization type work, right? Because if you want to do, you know, we weren't working on OpenStreetMap to create this, but you could very easily see a very similar process for getting volunteers to clean up OpenStreetMap in your town to get data government data sources into your into uh, you know our collective data set. Um, but yeah, other questions? Got I think like five minutes ish. Yeah. They charge a lot for that. <laughs> so no. So the, the ones, the holy grails for us would be post office would be a great resource and utilities would be a great resource. Um, but we don't have access to either of those. Um, so we're, our definition of vacancy is based off of primarily off of city services provided and tax delinquency. Um, there is another researcher in St. Louis that is doing similar work. Um, he includes complaint data. So, um, you know, like many cities, we have, you know, an information line and all the complaints get recorded into a database. And he uses that to when people complain about, uh, you know, problem properties near them. Um, and because of that, his number is like twice ours. Like it's the ridiculously different. Um, and uh, which shows that even even if you do go about this in like a really systemic way, because I'd, our our processes are different, but I have a really hard time like arguing with them. Be like, you know, like yeah, like that, you know. <laughs> Other than the fact that it's subjective, which is why we didn't include it. Like, but it's you know his analysis is sound. Um, you know, the answer is probably somewhere in the middle, right? <laughs> like somewhere between his number and our number is the right number. Um, but yeah. Any other questions? 
All right. Well, I'll stick around for like basically as long as we have the room to answer questions. Um, and otherwise, uh, I'll be here till I'm not. <laughs> so feel free to come find me or on Slack. Um, my email's uh, on the screen, so feel free to email me. Um, if you want to touch base with this, if you want to, if there's anything you want to know how we did it for your city, or if you happen to be in St. Louis, you want to get involved, either way, let me know. All right. Thanks.